Water is local. Every place has unique geology, ecology, weather, culture. Slow water solutions are each unique to their place. However, people around the world are going through some similar things with water and there are some common lessons. So I looked around the world and I tried to find places that were experiencing drought and flood and loss of glaciers that supplied water and urban areas and rural areas um, because I thought if I can offer up sort of one of each of these types of examples then no matter where someone is they could find ideas and inspiration for their own place. Thank you so much for joining me today. I am super eager to talk to you about your incredible book, Water Always Wins. And I thought that before we actually dived into the content of the book or the message, if you like, I'd like to just pan out a little bit because I know that you mention in the acknowledgements that some of the material for the book was developed in earlier articles and I was curious when I read that I thought hmm I wonder what motivated Erica to bring those articles together into a full book so if you're happy to start there that would be amazing sure yeah I think um, there are a couple of pieces to that one is that I loved reading growing up I mean I still do um, but uh, my family didn't allow us to watch television so I just read books all the time when I wasn't running around outside um, or, or making things. And so I have wanted to write my own book since I was about 10. And um, during my professional life as a journalist writing articles, um, I often thought about, well, you know, would this make a book or would that make a book? And um, I think, you know, I've been writing about water in a pretty focused way for about 15 years. And at some point I just realized that this aspect of the need to change our relationship with water and for people to really understand what working with water means and everything that it has to offer, I felt like that was something that the the general public, the dominant culture, really just wasn't getting. And mm -hmm. so I hoped that uh, the ability to really take space and do a deep dive in a book might offer me uh, the opportunity to present those stories in, in a different way. Mm. It's so lovely to hear that that love of reading books was also an influencing fact to hear because I think when I was reading the book myself, there's obviously the information that I'm getting from the book, but there's almost a sense of this very long journey that I get from, you know, getting to read more than one essay. So that, that makes a lot of sense. And you talked about the fact that people weren't getting it, this, this message about water changing our relationship with it. So again, I'm really curious, can you explain a little bit more when you thought about the reader of this book, when you thought about who you were really writing this book for, how would you describe that? That's a good question. I think most of my journalism is focused on the intelligent general public. So um, even when I write for Scientific American or Nature, which you might expect to be really kind of uh, science focused, even those publications, even Nature um, in its feature articles really strives to reach a general audience. Um, and so that's kind of um, the audience that I am experienced in talking to and so I think to a large extent that's who I was thinking of with regard to this book. But I also realized that water is local. Every place has unique geology, ecology, weather, culture. And so 
slow water solutions are each unique to their place. However, people around the world are going through some similar things with water and there are some common lessons. So I looked around the world and I tried to find places that were experiencing drought and flood and loss of glaciers that supplied water and urban areas and rural areas um, because I thought if I can offer up sort of one of each of these types of examples, then no matter where someone is, they could find ideas and inspiration for their own place. Um, and so I was also thinking of the kind of um, civic-minded person in their local area who really wants to become involved and to come up with a, a solution for their own place. Mm, I love that. And actually, when I think about that civic minded person having all of those examples, there is something about seeing what other people are doing, even if the conditions aren't exactly the same or the terrain isn't exactly the same, that sort of enables you to think outside of the box with what you've got yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. I like so, that. One final question about the process before we dive into the actual content. Um, again, in the acknowledgements, I love mining the acknowledgements <laughs> page because, it, you know, that, that's the moment that I put my writer's hat back on and I'm sort of thinking about my audience, a lot of, uh, lot of journalists or freelance writers in my audience who I know are sitting on top of nonfiction topics that they would love to, to turn into a book. So you talked about the fact that you had guidance about the book industry and crafting narrative. And you've really done that in a beautiful way in Water Always Wins. So you. you obviously took those lessons on board. <laughs> so I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. You know, what was that crafting narrative that you learned? What was the book industry guidance that you had? Mm hmm. Yeah, I think like on the industry side of it, book publishing is significantly different than journalism. And I don't think I fully appreciated that before I began the process. Uh, but fortunately, I had a lot of friends and colleagues who are book authors and who were generous in sharing their experiences. Um, so you know, I had to learn things like how to write a book proposal and um, do I want an agent? Uh, what are the benefits of having an agent? If I want one, how do I get one? Um, and so I did choose to get an agent. Um, and for me, that was incredibly helpful in terms of um, navigating this industry that I knew so little about. Um, and even after she got me uh, contracts with publishers, again and again, things have come up and, you know, I can turn to her and say, you know, is this normal? Is this how things are done? Is this something I should be worried about? Um, so having that kind of professional guidance I've found to be really valuable. And um, yeah, and so some of the ways that I found out how to do those things were from talking to friends and colleagues who have published books. And um, I think, uh, I was going to talk about another piece of that. Um, what was the second part of your question? Well, I was asking about the book industry, but also the crafting of the narrative. Oh, so right. The narrative. Thank you. Yeah. So um, I think you often hear that you should tell a story and not have a subject. And mm -hmm. I think my book is more of a natural subject and so I had to really search for the story to make it engaging with readers and to help people feel carried along by the, the narrative of the book. And um, early on I decided that water was my main character and that water's relationship um, with different entities was the focus as opposed to policy or economics or something like that. Um, and I did talk to somebody in the industry early on who suggested the chronological narrative, um, 
which can feel a little obvious, but I think it's the way that humans are geared to a large extent, and so it feels quite natural to us, and so it's, um, it's easy to follow. And given that there's so much going on in my book, I think that was a, a good thing to give readers. And so um, I'm sort of showing Waters' relationship with different entities through time. So, you know, I start with the present moment, but then I drop back to geologic time, and then we go through microbes and tiny critters and then beavers and then ancient or older humans, modern humans and, and future humans. And then the other kind of unifying factor um, was putting myself into the narrative. Mm -hmm. And, you know, traditionally in writing, you're told that's a big no, at least that's how it used to be when I was learning. Um, and I had uh, talks with my partner about this and he really discouraged me like, don't do it, don't do it. Um, but I talked to another writer who had put herself in the narrative and I kind of realized, um, you know, readers need that continuity. Like they're meeting so many people on five different continents um, and it can feel, I think, a little confusing, like, who are these people? Oh, I get to know this person, and then I leave them behind. Mm -hmm. um, so by having myself there throughout, it offers that kind of um, thread. Uh, but I tried to do it in a really subtle way. Like, I am not the story, and I'm not really important to the story. So I tried not to focus on myself, just have myself as like a stand-in for the reader reacting to the person that I was talking to and to the things that I was seeing in a way that I hoped might be um, relatable and uh, <laughs> maybe a kind of a common human experience. And um, also, you know, I was learning throughout the time that I was reporting this book, um, which is my favorite thing about writing is the constant learning of new things. And so I tried to make that clear so it wasn't like I was the expert, you know, kind of informing people of things, but rather that I'm learning along the way and you can come with me and, and learn as we go. Thank you for sharing that, Erica. It's fascinating to get that glimpse behind the scene, so to speak, having read the book now, especially when you touched on how much you yourself came into the story. It makes so much sense that you viewed Water as the character. I also think there was a really brilliant supporting cast in the Water Detectives. And I feel that just the way that you describe them, and because we have you meeting them, there's just such a sense of their energy and their passion and uh, that really, really moved me, actually. And I also really appreciated that light touch of your presence, knowing that you had memories of like a bygone age from your memories of, of Silicon Valley and, and the orchards. And actually, I found that that moment really poignant when you talk about the fact that our point of reference is a sort of local time Whereas actually, it's really important to understand how the landscape was hundreds of years ago, which, which we don't have a reference to. That, that to me, because I had a sense of your, your experience, I found that really impactful, actually. Thank you. That's, that's really good to hear. Um, and yeah, that was, that was my intention, because I think the, the number one thing I took away from water is that um, you know, water, water has a memory and water has a will and water wants to go where it wants to go. And, you know, we can thwart it for, to some extent, for some period of time. But ultimately, water is going to do what it wants. And often what it wants is to return to its historic places and patterns. Mm. And so, um, you know, a lot of the ways in which we get ourselves into trouble with water is... Uh, by not by not listening to water, by not asking what does water want, and not making space for it uh, within our own habitats. Yeah. So let's dive a little more <laughs> into the content. As I was reading the book, I was like, okay, so it's really helping me understand this kind of um, 
dominant culture think of water we, we you know it's a commodity as you say if, if we don't have enough or it, or if it's a threat if we think that we're going to get flooded um, or you know if, if we're worried about that but you talk about the fact that actually the the thinking or this dominant culture thinking is actually causing a lot of the problem and that really opened my eyes because obviously I've heard about climate change and how that's impacting water but it was really great to hear actually that there's a lot of the way that we're responding to flooding and drought that's also causing the problem mm -hmm. so the point of the question is this I know that there are lots of nonfiction writers who also see a way of thinking that they have an understanding is wrong or is causing a problem. And so I'm really curious as to how you felt talking about this, talking about, you know, here's a dominant culture of thinking, but here's another way of looking at it. Because when I'm reading the book, I don't feel like you're sort of arguing or I don't feel like you're really sort of stressing the point. You're just making the point really, really casually. So hopefully that makes sense. But I'm, I'm sort of curious as to how you did that, how you were making such a huge point and yet you were doing it so calmly, so beautifully and in often, often quite poetically. Oh, well, thank you. I'm really happy to hear that that's how it came across to you. Um, I think you know, in, in journalism, we're really taught to be objective or objective <laughs> to some degree. I mean, obviously there is, um, you know, will exerted in what you're going to cover and how you're going to cover it. Um, but we're often taught not to take a point of view or not to take mm -hmm. a strong point of view. And, you know, that can be different when you're writing a nonfiction book. Um, and so I had to wrestle with that a little bit. Um, but I think perhaps that training helps me to not come across as too didactic. Um, and I think I have come to agree with the water detectives because I've seen so much and I've learned so much and I've read so many of their scientific papers. Um, but really, you know, it's not my point of view, it's their point of view based on years of experience in, in working with water. Um, and so I think maybe that coming at it from that vantage point maybe helped in the delivery of, of that message. Um, and, you know, another potentially tricky area is that basically the idea of water as an entity with agency, water, um, asking what water wants, making space for water, not just taking from water, but also giving to water is a viewpoint that is held by many indigenous peoples around the world. Um, and so I definitely didn't want to seem like um, I was culturally appropriating their viewpoint. Um, I found people who aren't indigenous to their places who also have these beliefs that are based mm -hmm. on deep ecology principles, which is something that I myself am schooled in from, from grad school. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily solely an indigenous point of view, but um, I think indigenous peoples are probably the ones today who are most eloquent in speaking about this and, and have a, a certain authority um, in that. Uh, so anyway, I, I just wanted to be careful around, around that as well. Yeah, there's such beautiful care that you take and it 
it makes sense if you're saying, okay, here are the water detectives, they've got a great point, there's lots of evidence. It, it's, it's almost easy to just present it. I mean, not, not to say that the writing <laughs> process was easy and what you've done was easy, but if you're presenting the evidence, I suppose you don't have to start shouting or, or really stressing everything because the, because the evidence is, is there, so to speak. I know that you've been writing about water for, for well over a decade, but I'm curious to ask your personal opinion, if I, if, if I may, Erica, because when I was reading the book, I was so fascinated about the moment that how you felt when you sort of started to see this different truth, which is, oh my gosh, if we stop trying to control water, if we give it space, if we let it slow down, it's actually going to be a really beautiful solution. How did you feel when you started to see this other perspective? You know, I think I started to see that long before I started writing the book. Mm. And the fact that the vast majority of the dialogue that we hear around water doesn't acknowledge that as a solution is what motivated me to write the book because I felt like um, there is a lot of evidence and, um, you know, as, as one of my uh, water detectives told me, um, gray infrastructure, that is dams, levees, concrete um, engineered solutions, has a 150 year head start. Um, and so the science that shows that this slow water approach works is robust and growing, but it is still considered fringe by a lot of people. I was on a, a radio show with a well-known water engineer in California and I was talking about working with nature and he, he said what so many people say, which is like, well, that's nice, you know, but it can't be a significant part of the solution. And, you know, that's really a misunderstanding of scale. Um, so, you know, when you think and, and that's, I guess, what really hit me in, in accumulating all of this research was the extent to which we have subverted the natural water cycle globally. And, mm -hmm. you know, so a few of those stats are um, that we've dammed and diverted two thirds of the world's large rivers, uh, that we've filled or drained as much as 87% of the world's wetlands. Uh, mm -hmm. The pavement of our cities has doubled just since 1992. Floodplain encroachment since 1992 is covers an area the size of Ukraine. And, you know, floodplains exist to absorb floods. Mm. Um, and, you know, deforestation has a significant impact on rain locally and on the other side of the planet. And so when you begin to understand that, it's very obvious that the reason the engineered solutions have worked to the extent that they have is because there has been a lot of buffer in natural systems. But now we've grown to the point population wise, expansion wise, where we just don't have that buffer, you know, 75% of land on earth is degraded. And so that's a big part of why we're seeing, um, I mean, yes, climate change is a significant factor and I am not trying to uh, dispute that at all. But I think what's happened is both in journalism and in public policy, it's become kind of the only thing. Um, you know, it's all because of climate change. And in a way, I mean, yes, humans are responsible for climate change, but humans globally, humans writ large. And so it sort of um, relieves us of any responsibility for what we've done locally to our waterways and to our water systems. Um, and what I find really empowering about the stories of the water detectives is that even in a place where, uh, you know, nobody is meeting the Paris Agreement goals and it feels really hopeless, in fact, there's a lot that we can do in our own communities with our neighbors to make ourselves much more resilient to flood and drought. And it's not just the impacts of climate change that that can help, but there is actually uh, it actually helps to um, reduce climate change. And I don't just mean carbon stored in forests or wetlands, which is what, it's all kind of reduced down to carbon. But in fact, if you go back in the climate science, 
it was acknowledged that water is a greenhouse gas and that water vapor is the primary way that the earth cools itself. Um, but, you know, water is very complex. It's been challenging to model its intricacies uh, also because it involves plant responses. You know, plants can grow faster with more carbon dioxide. Um, they can release more water, um, but they can also, you know, close their stomata and hold in more water when it gets hotter. And so these plant responses are uncertain. Um, the formation of clouds is challenging. And so that sort of became like, oh, that narrative is too complex. So like, we'll just focus on carbon. But in fact, um, the water cycle is a really, really important climate, a part of climate change and climate change solutions. And we could get off fossil fuels tomorrow and it wouldn't solve climate change. And not just because of all the carbon dioxide that's like already in the atmosphere, but because of this water cycle issue. Um, so mm -hmm. yeah, that's something that I felt like people were just missing and I really wanted to try to communicate. I wanna go back, Erica, to the conversation that you gave an example of, the that's nice response, because one of the things I was curious about when I was reading your book, you've got this incredible evidence. Again, those statistics are just so powerful. The the amount of wetlands that, that have been drained, uh, the ri you know the rivers, the two thirds of the river. I want to get on. I want to get onto that. I'm curious about your opinion here because, as I was reading the book. And I was thinking about how people respond to change. And you've just given that example of that. That's nice. How much do you think that's to do with just the mindset? I'm so, you know, someone is so ingrained in the mindset of water as commodity, profit margins. There's a very interesting uh, explanation towards the end of the book that actually talks about the fact that nature is sort of taking the loss sort of um y you'll be able to word it better but as i was reading that i was thinking oh my god if it wasn't for the way that we're using water the actual companies would have to it would be things would be more expensive or they would have less profit so sort of take nature is is burdening that financial um that financial burden so I'm curious how much of it is just that fixed, that fixed mindset of we, we don't want to change. It's too scary to change. There's, there's too much built on this. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it has to do with people being invested in the status quo, right? You were talking about the idea of ec economic externalities. So in our economic system, we count the profits that a company makes um, from extracting natural resources, but we often don't require them to pay for those resources or, you know, they pay a pittance. And if there's pollution, then, you know, they can dump that in the environment and nature has to absorb it and deal with it or local people who live near it, um, you know, env environmental justice communities that are they're suffering the pollution. And the company takes all the more profits because they're not p taking responsibility for that. And, you know, laws have been passed that try to remedy that. And then um, companies pay lobbyists to, to try to get out of it. And it's, it's sort of a, a vicious cycle. Um, I think uh, so. So, yeah, that's the idea of externalities. Um, and I think. So certainly there's a financial incentive for people in power to continue to do that. In terms of engineers, like the one I was speaking with on the radio, I think <clears throat> you know, they're invested in, in their years of expertise and their dogma that they, they learned um, that uh, control is, is the way to go. And you know, that is pretty deeply ingrained in the dominant culture. Um, so they they feel very right and secure in that. Um, I do think it's a little bit of a generational thing. I was speaking to the Colorado Water Congress and one older guy referred to himself and his colleagues as old water buffaloes. <laughs> um, and I think, um, I think that's true. You know, they are kind of, they were trained in a certain way and they have a life, you know, a career of experience doing it that way. And I do see more 
um, in younger generations uh, that are coming up where they are more aware of complex systems and ecology and the limits of the approach that we've done so far. But unfortunately, a lot of engineering training um, still continues to be very control and, and concrete oriented. Um, I think too, we have grown used to these centralized solutions that are managed by experts like a dam in a reservoir. Um, but in fact, slow water solutions are smaller projects that are distributed across the landscape, which makes sense if you think of the, the giant scale at which we've disrupted water. You know, we need to make more space for water all along its path. And the cool thing about that is you can start small with what you have in front of you and that it's cumulative, like every little bit helps. Um, but I think also what causes change is often this kind of neighbor to neighbor sharing. So in Kenya, um, there were people from their own communities who would go talk to other smallholder farmers about approaches that they had done that it worked for them. And that was the main way that people wanted to change because they saw how well their neighbor was doing. And I've seen that in the American West. Um, like beavers are a great example for generations. People have thought that beavers cause flooding, they're a nuisance, animals, you know, shoot them, pull apart their dams, etc. And as the West has become drier and drier, not just from climate change, but from the age of drainage, as biologist Brock Dolman calls it, um, you know, they've realized, oh, wait a minute, you know, beavers slow water and they help that water to infiltrate into the ground. And that helps our streams to flow for more of the year and uh, natural grasses to grow and my cattle have more to eat. And so that kind of, oh, hey, this person in my own community has done this new thing and it's really working for them um, is often what, what brings change. Yeah, that's lovely. And it also makes me think about what we were talking about earlier when you were saying it felt important to give examples from all sorts of different areas. I mean, we, we, we're taken around the world and we meet so many fascinating cultures who are doing really incredible things with water, which, which I loved. I really loved to be able to learn about those experiences. I, I want to come to that question what does water want, Erica? Because that powerful question is, as I'm reading the book, it was always in the background for me. And <clears throat> this concept that as we get taken on, on your beautiful journeys, we meet more and more people who are treating water as a who rather than a what. And that completely resonated with me. I have a, a very deep spiritual practice. I've been trained in a shamanic tradition, so I work a lot with the elements. And it was so powerful for me because what started to happen is the book became a real metaphor. In the healing modality that I work in, water represents emotion. And when we're out of balance with that element within us, we become very rigid, we become very afraid of change. And so when you were giving these examples of what the dominant culture has done with water, I thought, my goodness, you could be talking about emotion as well, sort of what we've learnt to do with our emotion. We've learnt to sort of drain it and suppress it, <laughs> put it, put it in channels. And so I was, I'm curious as to, as to what you think about, did that, has that ever come up as you've been writing about water that you've learned about what it can represent in say the chakra system, the element of water and, um, and, and how it, how it can really help with personal healing? Yeah, I think for me, I have always had an innate affinity for nature and for other species, plants and animals. Um, <clears throat> and I think, I think all of us have that within us, you know, um, E.O. Wilson, the biologist called it biophilia. You know, we are uh, animals 
who love other animals, right? We love life um, and, and plants. <laughs> um, and so I think some of us haven't been exposed to that in a way that, you know, we often today live in cities kind of closed off from that. Um, but I was fortunate to have a lot of time outside when I was young and um, that really imprinted on me and um, even, even like my pets growing up, I was very <laughs> into them and in tune with them as, as beings, as, uh, you know, important uh, other beings in my life. Um, so I think coming from that point of view, it was very easy for me to see the, the being in water and to accept that water is alive and that water has complex relationships with all of these other living entities, <clears throat> including humans. Um, so for me, there feels like um, a real injustice in the way that we practice uh, what one source called human supremacy. And if you think about it, that is absolutely what we believe in our dominant culture, right? You often hear that when, uh, you know, we can't save that old growth forest because these jobs, these lumber jobs for humans are more important. Um, this toilet paper for humans is more important. Um, and that's just uh, kind of accepted in our culture as what's right. And I, I don't believe that's what, what's right. I don't believe that humans are more important than other beings. Um, and so I think, yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know where that leaves us in terms of your question, but um, to me, like paying attention and respecting other beings' rights to exist, including water, I think is the moral way uh, to exist on this earth. I think that paying attention feels really important. And actually, I, I, I'm almost thinking that was one of the water detective's explanations of, of like how he how he does it was that the example when you see a puddle and you you don't oh, yeah. realize yeah and, and and this sort of idea you know this puddle that most of us would think oh well that's just been collected from rain and it hasn't dried dried off yet is actually a sign that there's a spring underneath and the water detective is explaining when you start paying attention you see where water is you you sense where it is underground i feel that that paying attention is so important and again I was reading that thinking in my work working with humans and their own healing it is about paying attention it's about paying attention to what their landscape of their body is telling them and what's hidden those emotions that are very hidden and very deep that they have forgotten are there that they've dammed up or they've drained away I suppose the more I dive into and learn about the crisis that we're in, in terms of nature and climate change and how we're treating the earth, my response, Erica, because I'm a, I'm a practitioner, I'm a, I'm a life coach, I'm a healer, I see the relationship that we have with ourselves at the core of why we're being so damaging towards the earth. And I'm curious as to what you think about that and how what your thoughts are in terms of how can we rectify our relationship with the earth unless we rectify our relationship with our self? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. And I think, um, you know, you hear this often from indigenous peoples who have been pushed off of their land. They talk about the land and the water and the animals and plants who live there as as their relatives and as an intimate part of themselves so when they're not on the land when they're not with the water with the animals with the plants they're not fully themselves and i think um 
that's something that happens when a people lives in a particular place for a very long time. And, you know, I think some people that we don't necessarily think of as indigenous um, have that. Like, uh, you know, I've, I've visited Syria and Iraq and people have lived there for at least 12,000 years. Um, and, uh, you know, they have gone the agricultural route and perhaps um, exploited the environment in some ways. But, uh, you know, they are, the people who live there now are largely people who are indigenous to that area. They haven't, um, you know, migrated from somewhere else. Um, so I think I'm seeing more writing lately about this idea that in the dominant culture we also need to reconnect with nature and to see ourselves as part of nature. And you know, I talk about that in my book, the kind of the roots of the psychological and philosophical separation of humans from nature which doesn't make any sense. You know, humans are animals. We uh, <laughs> absolutely are part of the environment. And, and, you know, at multiple scales, we're part of the ecosystem, we're part of the globe. Um, and inside of us, uh, you know, we've got microbes. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's all happening at different scales, but we're really inextricable um, from the environment. And when we don't acknowledge that, you know, we've used that as a way to justify exploiting nature for profit, right? Um, it's just a thing. Uh, it's not as important as us. What's important is our profit. But really, you know, that system isn't providing enough for everyone. That system is providing a means for the very rich to get even richer. Um, and so I think um, I do see a, a growing movement um, to rethink global crony capitalism, to rethink the notion of constant growth, which is impossible on a finite planet, the, you know, the degrowth movement, um, things like environmental economics or donut economics, um, which encourage, you know, living within our ecosystem, um, living with more social equity. Um, so these conversations are happening and my sense is that they're gaining some momentum. But um, yes, I absolutely believe that reconnecting with the earth as an animal on this planet is, is fundamental to, um, to our emotional health and to our physical health as we continue to degrade the environment with the systems that we are currently operating under. Mm, thank you. That's so much food for thought. I love what you say about indigenous cultures who have really grown with the land and they they don't see themselves as whole if they're not in that relationship with the animals and with the plants and then i think on the flip side of the people who are benefiting from water as a commodity and perhaps this is judgmental but I sort of wonder how whole they are, you know, what, what's really causing them to chase that profit and want more and more, because often that is a sign that, that something's missing. And it's sort of ironic that possibly the thing that's missing is the thing that they're destroying. But I'm, I'm curious because you mentioned the microbiome and I loved it when that came up in your book. One of the things that I found fascinating, Erica, was the way that you really helped me see the entire ecosystem around water. So what happens when we when we don't allow floodplains to be floodplains and how that can really prevent the necessary nutrients and the necessary water draining into the soil, refilling up the aquifers. Um, and this idea of this entire ecosystem that has been disrupted because we're either damming or draining water. I, I have to say, when I was reading the book, I suddenly thought, my God, it's such madness that we built so close to rivers. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> it just when when yeah. you explained it the way that you did, 
I just thought it's such madness. And I suppose I'm curious as to, do you really think that was because at that point, humans really believed themselves to be more powerful than water? They really believed that they could control water? Hmm, that's an interesting question. I think I, I did a story a couple of years ago um, in, in British Columbia, Canada, there was a massive flood in 2021 caused by atmospheric river storms, but fundamentally caused by the fact that <clears throat> the area that flooded was a lake that was drained 100 years ago um, to make space for farmland in towns. And part of the way that they keep it dry is by pumping continually pumping the water away and four rivers kind of converge in this area. So, you know, the only real question is like, why didn't it flood sooner? <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, there were indigenous peoples who were displaced, um, who used to rely on this lake for uh, everything, for the, all their food, um, for a, a very oily fish that um, created this kind of glue that was an important uh, trading uh, uh, I guess, commodity, we could say. Um, but, you know, like many indigenous peoples, they did not live permanently on the banks of this lake. Their permanent homes were higher up and farther away, and they would temporarily, um, you know, during certain seasons, come to the lake uh, to, to harvest the things that they needed and wanted from the lake. Um, so, you know, this is a practice you see again and again. I have a story in California, you know, the great floodplains of the Central Valley. And when the settlers came, um, you know, the indigenous Californians were like, don't build there. <laughs> and the settlers were like, ah, we know what we're doing. And, you know, then flooded the, the next winter. Um, so, you know, I think there is, there is a certain hubris. And I think if you go back, you know, you can pinpoint that kind of choosing to separate from nature, you can pinpoint it all the way back to Genesis. Um, in the Bible, uh, you can pinpoint it to uh, the Renaissance and uh, Rene Descartes. You know, it kind of, it, it depends, um, but I think people, settlers, European settlers in the United States were interested in profits and trading and rivers are handy for that and being close to the river makes it easier to get things onto ships. Um, you know, people needed water to drink. Um, they also were dumping a lot of their sewage into rivers. Um, I mean, that still happens in many places, including in the UK <laughs> and in the US, um, despite our, our sewage treatment systems. Um, so I think maybe it was that kind of short-sightedness, you know, the dominant culture really has a focus on, tends to do single focus problem solving. You know, we're worried about flooding, let's build a wall. Um, we don't have enough water, let's build a, an aqueduct and bring it from somewhere else. Um, you know, we need to ship, like, let's optimize it. Let's build as close as possible to the river so that we can save money by not having to carry it farther, etc. Um, but, you know, it doesn't involve thinking in systems and how those systems actually work. And it doesn't involve much respect for these natural systems and how they function and the many, many, many life-giving services that they provide for us if we leave them enough space to be healthy. Um, so, yeah, I think there, there is a certain hubris in that and uh, maybe blinders. Um, and short-sightedness and greed. Mm. When we talk about the concept of a natural system, we've got, on one hand, we've got possibly some short-sightedness, possibly some greed. What really occurs to me, if we come back to this question of what does water want, there's also that question of what can water can can teach us because it throughout the book you're talking about people who are learning about solving nature with nature so they're really learning from just observing the natural world and observing what water does 
And I sort of think to myself, especially when I read your the section that talked about, um, for example, how a solution such as an aqueduct actually really puts us out of relationship with water because it makes us think that we've got more than we have or it, um, I think there was another really good example but it's it's putting us out of relationship with essentially the truth that we're not able to see anymore because we've created this solution that gives a sort of false display and so we're kind of living almost in a strange virtual reality where we're not seeing nature as it truly is and therefore we can't benefit from the wisdom of nature that is there all around us because we're actually seeing a very strange sculpted version of nature devoid of what it can teach us mm -hmm. um, you're nodding so yes hopefully that did make sense <laughs> I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that yeah you know there's a newish um, idea in restoration ecology which is called adaptive management and the idea is that you can you can create a project you can restore things as you think could be the right way to go but ultimately you need to watch the system you need to have that close observation to understand the impact that your changes have made and to understand whether you need to continue to tweak it um, to help it get to a point of uh, being able to maintain itself to a larger degree. And um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, that's that's getting back toward the right track. Um, and yeah, the idea of a big reservoir of water brought from somewhere else is sort of the ultimate in separation from nature. Um, and the reason why um, indigenous cultures and, and other people who live close to the land uh, today have maybe a better chance of uh, restoring natural water systems is because they are able to observe in real time, you know, the impacts that their actions are having. Um, and in terms of what water wants, you know, what I, what I came to realize in reporting this book is um, what water wants is a return of these slow cycles that are particularly prone to disruption by the dominant culture. So floodplains, wetlands, mountain meadows, forests, place that naturally slow water on the land and allow water to have that dynamic relationship with the land that um, restores a healthy water cycle in a lot of ways. And that to me also feels like a perfect analogy, Erica, because we aren't going slow in our own lives either. We're sort of speeding up to the point that there's more burnout than there ever was before. And when you talk about the indigenous peoples who are able to really observe their impact on the land, I sort of feel that we humans have become so impatient that we we've almost lost that skill to be able to to wait for something to unfold we you know we have to have the solution right now and we've got all sorts of people kind of knocking at the door saying has the problem gone away so there's a lot of pressure but i sort of feel that that slow water is just this beautiful metaphor for ev for everything really if we can be if we can be slow like water and allow water to be slow i feel like some beautiful healing both with the earth and with ourselves would take place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I feel like the communities who have undertaken these kinds of projects are really fulfilled by them. You know, they feel very excited that to see these projects working. Um, a lot of them become uh, evangelizers isn't quite the right word, but you know, they want to share their success and mm -hmm there's a real excitement in that. Um, and I think part of that is that reconnection with the earth. Um, you know, uh, life doesn't just exist on earth, but is part of earth, right? And we are part of that. And so engaging with that in a, in a real way I think, um, you know, brings a lot of 
tangible benefits in terms of reducing flooding and water scarcity, um, you know, increasing food systems um, or support for food systems, but also uh, emotional fulfillment, I think, from a sense of agency and community, but also that connection with the earth. Yeah, yeah, that's so beautifully said. This has been so delicious. Thank you so much. It's just been an absolute treat to be able to read the book and have all of these questions fizzing around and then get to have an hour of your time and, and ask you all of them. I, I just want to give one final moment before we close. It, it might be that there was a question that I didn't ask that you thought, oh, that would have been such a perfect question to ask at that moment. Or it might be that in the discussions that we've had, something has dropped in, an insight or an idea that you just feel to share. So is there anything else that you'd like to say? I think we've covered a lot. I think um, for myself, since I've written this book, I've become more and more intrigued by this relationship uh, between water, life, and climate, which I talked about as being overlooked. And, that, and I do talk about it in, in Water Always Wins, um, but there's a lot more to say about it and a lot of exciting science and, and projects uh, that are related to it. And I think, um, yeah, I just, uh, that, that kind of uh, attention to water and what it's doing is uh, a, a pushback against uh, what we're seeing in, in so many ways. And so for, for me and my reporting, I have really developed a curiosity about water. And when I'm walking around my town or when I'm out in the forest, um, I'm often thinking about what water is doing and how water has been subverted and, and what water really wants to do. And I think that kind of engaged curiosity uh, is a good starting place um, for people in their their own places and I hope that it's inspiring to them. Mm, I, I love that you that you say that this idea that actually we can just begin with curiosity because sometimes there is a sense of like where do I start and that the sort of image of you getting more curious yourself it makes me think actually there was a there was a area that I used to live in the UK in Shropshire um, lots of pine forest topped hills and I'd go walking there with my dog and uh, my dog's a rescue and in the first few years that I had him he was really nervous of water hmm. in the hills we'd be walking in the hills we'd be walking down the sort of logging paths and every so often he would freak out and I started to realize there must be underground there must be underground water and he was sensing that because he used to do exactly the same thing that he would do when he was next to a running stream and that for me was the wow. first experience I had of like I'm walking on a hill I'm surrounded by forest but there's also loads of streams running beneath me so I can really relate to what you say this sort of sense of there's so much more to nature that we can't see but curiosity is such a great place to start Wow, I love that idea of the dog as the water diviner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the water, water divining dog. Yeah. <laughs> Erica, thank you so much for today. Thanks so much for inviting me. This has been a really fun conversation. Thank you.